Welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us today. Today we have the opportunity to dig into a series we did this fall as we looked at data around stalled learning recovery and the bright spots that we're seeing as we come out of COVID. We are going to begin by our session today by looking at a highlight reel with video clips from four sessions in the series that our production team has pulled together. Then our moderator, John Gompert, will join us live and we'll open the discussion with our panelists for today. Our panelists today include Yoli Flores, the CEO and president of Families and Schools based in Los Angeles, whose mission is to involve families and communities in their children's education to achieve lifelong success. We have Kenneth B. Mason, the fifth congressional district member for the Georgia State Board of Education and school improvement instructional coach of 20 years for the Southern State, um, Southern Regional Education Board. And finally, we have Lindsay Sobel, the chief of policy, planning, and external affairs at Teach Plus, who has worked to deepen regional impact in 12 states. So we welcome each of you, our panelists today, um, and to our audience, we will start with the look at this highlight reel and please be on the lookout for some discussion starters and polls. We want to hear from you today as we look back on what we've learned this year. As I already said, John Gompert, our, an executive fellow with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading will be our moderator for today. And he will be opening the conversation with some pre-recorded remarks. So Sierra, let's begin. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this year-end recap of recent highlights, stalled learning recovery and bright spots of 2023. This fall, as part of an ongoing focus on recovery from the pandemic, we hosted a series of conversations to better understand in detail, well beyond the headlines, the new student achievement data that came out this summer, and then to explore its ramifications for our work together to recover from the learning loss that children experienced during the pandemic. The news, as you will recall, is not great. Multiple reports found that the hope for post-pandemic bounce back did not materialize. In fact, the disparities that we hope to see closing are proving to be particularly sticky. And just like compounding debt, the cumulative effect of a slow learning recovery is powerful, it's worrisome, and it could be long lasting. So even though we saw and we highlighted many positive innovations that came during the pandemic and as we emerged, we also see persistent bad news. While there are important exceptions, broadly speaking, the data show that we've stalled in the learning recovery efforts. That's true overall, and that is especially true and especially worrisome for young people from economically challenged families and kids of color. So in addition to digging into the data, we spoke with a wide range of experts about their observations and about the bright spots that suggest that this kind of stalled recovery is not actually inevitable. We spoke with people who work in different types of school settings, with thought leaders, and with representatives from influential partner organizations. Our guests shared reflections on where we are, honestly facing up to the bad news, and at the same time, underscoring and explaining some of the more promising bright spots in schools, in communities, and in states, places that are beating the national trends. We also heard from a range of local leaders who are pursuing strategies specifically designed to take on the learning recovery challenge. And we look forward to more of those conversations in the weeks and months to come. In today's session, we're gonna hear highlights from four discussions from this fall that we think are particularly useful in understanding where we are and what the path forward can look like. We'll start with the session that introduced the latest data on student progress during the 2022-2023 school year. This session featured four experts in data. Avery Cambridge with McKinsey and Company, Peggy Carr, who is the commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics at the Institute of Education inside the Department of Education, Karen Lewis with NWA, which put out a big report, 
and Jennifer Saddam with Curriculum Associates, who, which also put out a big report. Thanks for listening. And with that, let's turn to our highlights from the first session. At NWA, we've been able to take advantage of our deep well of longitudinal data on student achievement and growth so that we can track students during the pandemic and compare progress and achievement back to historical trends. Our most recent report focused on the totality of the 2022-23 school year. And of course, we had hoped to be able to show additional progress to rec recovery and to show that those gaps were continuing to shrink. But unfortunately, we saw the opposite. And during 2022-23, what we actually found was that growth lagged behind pre-pandemic trends again. But I think it's also important to consider that uh, the harm from the pandemic is really acting like a compounding debt. And by failing to address unfinished learning that has accumulated in previous years, students are less well prepared as they move into the next grade. And this may be actually impeding their ability to keep pace with pre-pandemic learning trends. In summary, what we're seeing overall in our research in this most recent report and across a series of nine reports is that students are showing some sides of pandemic recovery, and I don't want to lose sight of that altogether, but that progress has certainly been modest and has largely stalled during this most recent school year. Importantly, the amount of additional learning needed to catch up cannot be recouped in a single year or in one single magic silver bullet intervention, and that's especially true for older students. And finally, and most importantly, I think we can never lose sight of the fact that the achievement disparities that existed prior to the onset of the pandemic have only widened significantly over the last three years, and marginalized students are those that remain the furthest from recovery. We see no evidence in our data of special levels of catch up among the students that have been hardest hit and have presumably been more targeted for recovery interventions. They remain further behind their peers in many ways. Uh, in August, Curriculum Associates released two reports. The first report is our annual state of student learning report. And in that report, uh, we share the results of how students are doing on the iReady diagnostic. Like NWEA and others, our data also show that academic disparities and equities that were exacerbated during the pandemic show uh, no signs of closing uh, in 2023. We administer the diagnostic to uh, grades um, K uh, through eight. So our state of student learning report includes results for students in grades one and two. We, um, you will see when you're looking at the graph that um, in reading students in grades one and two we have fewer students who are on grade level in 2023 compared to students who are in grades one and two prior to the pandemic in 2019. The gaps between now and the pandemic are largest in the early grades. If you look at um, 2022 compared to 2023, you do see a, a slight uptick and early grade reading is the one area where we do see um, a slight improvement um, in students who are uh, getting to grade level. I'll talk a little bit about the National Assessment of Educational Progress, known as the nation's report card. It is the only ongoing assessment of what students know and can do, and key subjects being uh, reading and math. So this is a comprehensive picture of what uh, students have uh, been doing and uh, exhibiting in the uh, area of math and reading since we started the state assessment. Um, just in general, uh, both um, mathematics and reading from the pre-pandemic period of 20, um, 2019 to 2022, we see historic declines um, in both uh, reading and math, particularly math. I do want to say, though, there are some areas of bright spots, if we can call them that, for eighth grade reading that are uh, of worth noting. Uh, for, for, the, for the case of math, everyone, all states, all of them show declines in the jurisdictions, various di jurisdictions as well. But for reading, we had 10 states that held steady. Also, we saw that large cities, these are cities with 250,000 or more, uh, uh, that would describe and characterize them, 
uh, they held steady. That is also a bit of uh, encouraging news. 21 large districts also held steady for eighth grade reading. And there was at least one uh, district, uh, LA, uh, Los Angeles, that showed a nine point increase. We also used the data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And what we wanted to do is say, you know, we have the national picture, you know, what's the, what, what is the variation by states? There's a huge variation in, you know, which states students are, were further behind their peers pre-pandemic um, than others. So, you know, relative to others, causes for celebration are states like Texas, Louisiana, even California, where you'll see, you know, only 10%, 6%, you know, 12% of students are over a half year behind relative to where they were uh, pre-pandemic. One important thing to note, right, is that even within states, there's huge levels of inequity. But what this slide is showing, right, is um, the difference in learning delay between the top performing students in each state and the bottom 25% performing students in each state. And what you'll see here is states like Wisconsin, Washington, Pennsylvania, Florida, uh, there's relatively little difference in how much kind of the bottom students dropped back. So the, the state kind of students move together as, you know, relatively one cohort, where in states like Virginia, Oklahoma, Maryland, Michigan, there's huge variation in kind of how big the gap kind of started to diverge between the top performing students and the bottom performing students. And I think this has, you know, really, really broad implications for how folks kind of target their, you know, at one point COVID recovery funding, right? If you know that the bottom performing students are way behind the top performing students, you need to have more targeted kind of interventions and kind of selection of which districts, programs, students you're working with. One thing when we kind of looked at our map and tried to start to parse out why states look differently, that was a little bit heartening is we saw some themes of some common interventions that actually have proven to uh, mitigate kind of learning delay and learning loss that we'll share with you now. Um, with a caveat for many of the folks on the webinar that, you know, knowing the evidence of what works is only half the battle, and I'll show those examples. The other half is implementation, and we know that can have a huge impact on how effective each of these three things are. The first thing I want to talk about is, you know, use of high quality instructional materials paired with high quality professional learning, right? Nebraska and Louisiana are two great examples of this. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw Nebraska invest a portion of the state's ESSER recovery funds in uh, kind of widespread availability of the digital math curricula, uh, ZERN, for students. And we saw that students that used the ZERN math online regularly uh, had, you know, over two and a half times the rate of learning growth in math scores on state tests than those that didn't use it. Louisiana has been kind of a leader nationally in uh, promoting use of high quality curricula across the districts. In during the pandemic, they allotted an additional 40 million uh, to investing in additional supports for high quality curricula. So literacy screeners, additional science and reading curricula for kids uh, and Louisiana nationally saw a two point increase in the national assessment of educational progress reading scores from 2019 and 2022. A few other points to call out, high quality, high intensity tutoring. The example I'll talk about here is uh, Tennessee. So Tennessee Department of Education invested roughly 200 million of the state's federal COVID recovery funds in availability of high dosage tutoring for their districts. I think the most important thing that we need to be thinking about right now, what has to be front of mind is thinking about dosage. We heard earlier from Avery talk about some of the strategies that we know are effective um, and I completely agree with those are the right kind of strategies to be thinking about. I think what's missing from the equation is often not just are we doing the right things, but taking it a step further to understand whether we're doing enough of the right things. So taking summer school as an instance, my colleagues here at NWA in partnership with about 12 districts across the country and researchers at Harvard and AIR looked at how effective summer programming was in districts looking to use that as one of their COVID recovery strategies. And what they found was that, yes, there does seem to be some test score increases, especially in math for students that participated in summer programming. 
However, and it's a really big however, the dosage falls far below what would be needed to actually make a dent in any kind of COVID learning losses. I think it's important to reiterate that the effort required to catch kids up, it's too great to condense in a single school year or in a single intervention. So it's really critical to be thinking about recovery, not just as a multi-year effort with layered supports um, and be clear eyed that this is an effort that will undoubtedly extend past the availability of those federal recovery funds. We cannot take our foot off the gas. I get a really strong sense of fatigue in the community of continuing to talk about learning loss and continuing to show how current achievement trends compare to pre-pandemic trends. And I get the sense like, okay, this is just our new normal. Can we stop talking about it? This is just how it is now. Let's quit looking back. And I would say that that would be um, problematic for the average kid. It would be devastating for the kids at the margins. And that for me is what keeps me going, that we cannot look away and just pretend that COVID never happened and that this is our new reality uh, because that leaves behind the kids that were already struggling mightily prior to the onset of the pandemic. That was a pretty sobering update on student learning recovery. Definitely not what we'd hoped for, but with some bright spots and innovations that could inform future action. To continue our efforts, efforts to uncover innovations and effective practices that enabled students to beat the trends conveyed in these national data, we engaged representatives of Catholic charter schools, rural, urban, and defense department schools to join us the following week to share their insights, their successes, and their lessons learned. This session engaged David Ardry of the National Rural Education Association, Raymond Hart of the Council of Greater, Great City Schools, Drew Jacobs of the National Alliance of Public Charter Schools, Kathleen Porter McGee of the Partnership Schools, and which is a nonprofit school management organization leading Catholic schools in New York and Cleveland, and Beth Shavino Narvez of the Department of Defense Education Activity, the system known as DODIA. Let's just listen in to hear their insights. So I think one of the things that, that makes Catholic schools experience um, stand out and make them an outlier in the COVID world is the fact that, that our schools were, were able for a variety of different reasons to open earlier and to, and to stay open longer. We have always been a turnaround organization. So we actually have, our, our experience pre-COVID was um, taking schools that were serving students who were significantly behind and, and demonstrating some, um, some fairly dramatic academic achievement increases. And what we learned in, in that pre-COVID era is, are the lessons that we are still applying today. And I think on a very simple note, there are probably two buckets that I would, I would put those lessons in. One is the bucket of focus. I think one of the things can be really tempting, particularly when, when you're serving students who are experiencing so many diverse challenges, it can be very tempting to like grab a bunch of different strategies and throw everything up against the wall and just like hope that something sticks. Um, we don't have the luxury of doing that for a lot of reasons. And so, and, and, and again, it's been an unintended blessing because we have found that by focusing on doing a few things well, we can actually serve student needs, I think, more effectively. Um, and very specifically, to even get a little bit more granular, yeah. we are um, a curriculum, and unapologetically curriculum driven, the things that we say is it's really important to us. It's our job at the network level to make sure that every teacher in our network has what they need to meet the kids where they are and get them where they need to go. And we think that core to that work is choosing curriculum that has everything they need and then get really good about implementing that curriculum with fidelity and, and holding up a really high bar of excellence. And so that focus on curriculum implementation, I think, is, is central to our work pre-COVID and continues to be central to that work. Um, I work Always. with the Kelsey City Schools, who uh, we represent 78 of the nation's largest urban school districts, and several of our districts are actually either performing well uh, in terms of uh, addressing the unfinished learning the kids have seen, mm -hmm. or actually better than they were. So Baltimore City Public Schools is an example. In English language arts, they're actually better now than they were pre-pandemic uh, in their English language arts. Guilford County Public Schools is another example um, in mathematics. They are actually almost twice recovering at almost twice the rate in mathematics. And then Dallas ISD is another example. I could provide others. Uh, last year uh, for Dallas ISD, their African-American students 
had already performed better in uh, grades three through eight with the exception of fifth grade than they had mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. So uh, we often talk about educational torque and what our urban schools are able to provide to kids. They were providing it pre-pandemic. And so we're seeing that um, across the uh, across the, the, the districts and across the country. Obviously, we still clearly got more work to do, uh, both in addressing the unfinished learning from the pandemic, uh, but also in uh, closing the gap that we had with our peers nationally, even pre-pandemic. Large districts actually can be quite nimble. Um, I think they uh, offer opportunities for our students to be innovative. Uh, we talk about innovative practices. I'll use Guilford as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, in their recovery from the pandemic, uh, they immediately reached out to a number of universities in the area. Uh, a number of our districts, uh, or a number of districts across the country, actually, uh, were quick to hire, for example, uh, tutoring programs, things like that. Um, a number of our districts have done is really tap into the talent that they have in terms of lifting up the teachers, providing professional learning opportunities for the teachers to really improve classroom instruction. And we've seen that in Dallas and Denver, and San Diego and other places around the country where that focus on building up the teachers that we have uh, has been a means for their improvement as well. So the Department of Defense Education Activities serves military connected students. So children of active duty military members and some DOD Department of Defense uh, civilians. And we serve nearly 70,000 students in 160 schools in seven states, 11 countries, and then Guam and Puerto Rico. Um, and so we are based in three regions in the Americas, in Europe, and the Pacific. So when the NAIT came out in 2022, DODIA is considered one of the 52 jurisdictions that is yeah. assessed. So the 50 states and Washington, D.C. and then DODIA. And um, we ended up being the top performer um, of all 52 jurisdictions and the only jurisdiction to see improvement. And I'm really pleased to report that we continue to see sustained progress and improvement on our own uh, summative assessments that we give to students as well. And our, our story is similar um, to the partnership schools in a lot of ways. So as I think about what enabled us to pivot during COVID and what, what is enabling us to be ready to pivot in the future is the strong foundation that we established. Um, and so, you know, like Kathleen, the experiences that we had during pre-COVID are those that we're still applying. So what we have um, done in DODIA is that we've had an eight year journey um, of sustained focus on college and career ready standards. So we had to raise the bar. Right? While it was a singular focus, we didn't just do one thing, right? So we built a system. So we adopted higher standards, consistent standards for every school um, in DODIA. We invested in high quality instructional resources aligned to those standards, but then we were asking teachers to do something different. And so when you ask people to do something different, it's your obligation to provide them with the professional development and the professional learning to know how to do that. So we invested heavily in teacher professional learning. I'm from the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools and we're essentially the, the you know, predominant national organization advocating for charter school uh, growth and expansion across the country. Charter schools educate about 7.5% um, of public school students across the country. Right now, that's about 3.7 million students. Um, there are about 8,000 charter, school, um, charter schools and campuses located across the country in about 46 or so uh, states and territories. So we have a pretty wide reach. We've kind of been engaged in thinking about COVID and experiencing it. Um, what we've seen is we've seen a, a huge enrollment increase for charter schools. I serve two roles currently. I serve as the president of the National Rural Education Association. Uh, at the state level, I serve as the executive director of the Association of Illinois Rural and Small Schools, or the state affiliate of the National Rural Ed. And there are, you know, 40 plus some state directors across the country that represent their states uh, around rural education. Um, we threw a lot of money, a lot of resources at the problem. We left a very valuable resource on the table, and that's time. Time. 
you can't buy time and we can't buy back. I know, uh, John, you shared with me that that NWEA says it'll take about 4.1 and 4.5 months, additional months to catch up in math and reading. Yep, right out of pandemic, we left kids home for the summer. We didn't, we just didn't have the, the wherewithal to say, we're coming to school and we're gonna spend two and a half months of the summer back in school. We're gonna go to year round school, maybe extend the year by 20 days instead of 181 or if you're on a count. and. I think the issue for me is that maybe the adults are the barriers. And in regards to time, right? It's not an it, it's not an easy uh, it's not an easy kind of just more time. I think for the future. So one of the things that quite a few um, state education agencies are looking at is you know getting away from the old Carnegie unit and yeah. seat time. Right, yeah. and that it's really about mastery. Have students mastered what we expect them to know and be able to do? And time could be variable. Some students might need more time, some different kinds of supports, and other students might be able to master that content and move on more quickly in terms of like, let's leverage some of the innovations from the pandemic, this notion of anytime, anywhere learning. We heard more informative and inspiring bright spots in that session. Each of those leaders had insights that can inform actions in schools, districts, communities, and states, high quality curriculum, teacher professional development, effective usage of time, and more. We continue to dig deeper with another conversation engaging leaders from organizations representing state chiefs, superintendents, and elementary school principals, asking them to lift up actionable strategies that can accelerate equitable learning recovery. That session engaged Gracie Branch with the National Association of Elementary School Principals, Scott Hagerman of the Tanca Verde Unified School District in Tucson, Arizona, Ann Levitt with AASA, which is the School Superintendents Association, and Rosalind Rice Harris with the Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO. Here's what they had to share. We're the National Association of Elementary School Principals. And even though we have elementary in our name, we certainly represent principals pre-K through eighth grade. We were founded in 1921 as an organization of elementary and middle school principals and other education uh, leaders throughout the United States, Canada, and we have a strong relationship with principals in the overseas schools. We advocate for principals uh, to have high quality professional learning. I don't have to tell everybody that the last couple of years have been really challenging for school leaders. Well, really everyone connected with education. I mean, families, students, teachers, uh, principals in schools. And so um, we really are recovering, I think still in recovery from COVID, but I see school leaders very determined uh, to meet students and families where they are. Um, I think it, uh, there were some good things that happened with uh, COVID, certainly that technology piece. Uh, gave us new avenues to communicate and work with our families and not think that every activity has to be done at school. So that was a good thing. The recovery funds that were given to schools were so helpful in giving them the money to provide some servant services with social workers, intervention specialists, that they may not have had before. For those um, principals that I see are really making great strides in schools, first of all, they have a real uh, knowledge base about pre-K through third grade. Those for that continuum, when they, from the first minute, they get kids at that school, thinking about transitioning from grade level to grade level, how each grade level builds on that. Uh, they are looking around their school and they are not just thinking about engaging parents in the community, but really forming beneficial partnerships, uh, looking at the pre-K 
kindergarten, the preschools that surround their school, developing relationship with those preschool centers before those kids even come to kindergarten. We take great pride in the work that we've done to lead superintendents and districts and uh, central office folks through a very difficult time in our history. The organization serves about 10,000 members, and they are primarily at the executive level um, in school districts. If we're going to accelerate learning, we have to deal with some of the other issues that influence those outcomes. We must look at effective strategies for dealing with absenteeism, mm -hmm. staffing shortages, and professional learning for our frontline folks who are in the classroom. So while we are having a national conversation about uh, school bus drivers not being available, if the students can't get to school, then how are we going to deliver instruction for them? And if we're going to use technology, how do we ensure that broadband access is available to them? So superintendents are looking at the entire picture. When we think about learning acceleration, we have to be sure that the staff is really equipped to manage the different levels of instruction needed and the different levels of performance in the classroom and at the school level. We've seen a great exodus in the teaching ranks. We've seen a great exodus in the school-based leader uh, ranks, and we've certainly seen a great exodus in the superintendent or school district leader ranks. We must focus on staffing, but not just staffing, staffing of persons who are committed to equity and skilled so that they, we are able to accelerate learning in the way that we know um, needs to happen. So the Council of Chief State School Officers, or CCSSO, just to add to the acronym alphabet for everyone, uh, supports our state education leaders. We call them chiefs in different states. They're called superintendents or commissioners. Uh, we support them as well as the state education agency staff. There have been significant investments and it's going to take a while to see the overall investments begin to pay off. Like we're not gonna go from zero to 100, especially if we, for many of our students who are already starting behind. However, there are investments that have shown that they're beginning to pay off. And we are seeing impacts related to academic recovery. So for example, in Nebraska, students are engaging with Zern, which is a computer-based math acceleration tool. And the SEA saw two and a half times growth on statewide math assessments compared to, the, to their peers, those students' peers, who did not use that tool. So the state was able to utilize their 10% set aside to invest in this acceleration tool. And because of that investment, well, correlation to that investment is that growth on the statewide math assessments. Additionally, uh, in its first year of Ohio statewide mathematics and literacy tutoring grant, they were able to recruit and train and deploy over a thousand tutors. And those tutors supported almost 5,000 students and provided nearly 15,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one or small group tutoring. So we've seen these investments in uh, high impact tutoring, uh, in supporting with uh, technology programs to provide this acceleration for students. And we have data from at least three states, and these are just highlights, there are many more, yep. uh, where we're able to see this targeted uh this targeted intervention this targeted planning and support pay off in terms of student, in terms of student achievement Tankerverde is on the east side of tucson we have four schools two k6s a junior high and a high school about 2200 kids um, it's a mix of open enrolled kids from all through tucson and kids in Tankerverde. so it's kind of a an eclectic population. Um, 
And since 2017, our school district has really worked towards becoming a professional learning community. And our model is really based in that work. When I first started, I think teams felt like they had to do everything great. And I was like, let's do less well. And so when we went into the pandemic, we weren't trying to reproduce like virtual learning as if it was in person. We really kind of energizing people to be responsive to the things that are most important for that learning, for that grade level, for that content area, and let them play with models. Trying to look at your school and look at your district and say, here's the things we have in place. And so you're not just saying, here's all the things that we need to do. It's like, here's the things we need to do and here's how it relates to what we have in place. So it's like, it's a doable next step. One thing that we have tried to do, and I, I know, and you do it at AASA too, is, you know, we really try to get networks of people together. Like we have communities of practice for assistant principals, new principals. We have centers of advancing leadership where groups of people can get together, principals, school leaders can meet regularly and discuss how to do these things. You know, what has actually worked in their school? What challenges did they find so that um, principals can talk to other principals? One thing that CCSSO does, uh, we work very hard to provide uh, the most relevant, up-to-date research and technical assistance to our state chiefs. So that mm -hmm. is the work that I lead. Uh, I, I lead uh, about 17 professional learning communities that are job specific for uh, our chiefs in their cabinet, as well as their staff. So there they're able to uh, receive professional learning that's relevant to their roles. In that previous session, we got both a deeper understanding of the challenges that education leaders are facing, as well as where they're seeing progress and what is fueling that progress. In the fourth and final session that is featured in this recap, we're zooming out a little more to engage national thought leaders in education in a discussion of the role of bipartisan efforts around education reform, the need for accountabilities for schools, districts, states, and some possible changes at the national, state, and local levels that could create an educational landscape that ensures more hopeful futures for children. This session featured Jean-Claude Brizard of Digital Promise, Bruno Mano of the Walton Family Foundation, and Mike Petrilli of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Let's take a listen at some of the highlights of that conversation. Of course, after the pandemic with this terrible learning loss that you've been focused on in some of your webinars, plus the terrible mental health crisis, we have big challenges. Uh, and so we need people to come together and to try to find solutions. Uh, and, you know, and yet, what are we doing? Uh, we're mostly just fighting. The media is very focused on those fights. Uh, yeah. There's not a lot of attention. So all that said, John, you know, we brought a group together in this Building Bridges initiative. This was about 18 months ago to say, you know what, can we get some people left, right, and center, diverse group uh, to just get in the same room together again, talk about some of these issues, remind each other about, you know, what is it that we care about from a deep, deep level and see if over time, after spending more time together, we, we can rebuild relationships and maybe start to come up with a common agenda for going forward. And I'm, I'm happy to report we succeeded. I mean, we certainly uh, were able to rebuild relationships. The old adage, you know, spending time in person, it made a huge difference. But we also came out with this call to action called a generation at risk that tries to say, hey, we need to do much more than we're doing as a country for this generation of kids while we also work on building the next education system going forward. The report is at buildingbridgesineducation.org. It's not very long, so you know people can take a look at it there. A couple of things. I mean, first of all, we all reaffirmed our belief in public education as a critical player in preparing citizens to participate in our democracy as an engine of social and economic mobility, huge respect for educators and parents and the role that they play. You know, the belief that, look, what we're trying to do is to make sure that every child has a chance to, to fulfill their potential. You know, these are things, of course, we all agree around. Now, in terms of what the a more responsive education system might do in the future, we want it to be firmly centered around students and their needs. 
obviously, if we care about the future of the country, you got to make sure the schools are as strong as possible and we're not getting the job done. Uh, the other thing I'd say, John, is that you do see at the state level some leaders stepping up, again, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and of course, that is where most of the decisions are made. That is where uh, you know the key action lies. And so that part is heartening. Uh, now, sometimes those states aren't very bipartisan themselves. It might be yeah, a very right. red state or a very blue state. Uh, but you do see some places where governors are saying, you know, very loudly, hey, we've, we really need to do better by this generation of kids, but we need more of that. Another point, and this probably is considerably different than, I want to make a point about the political environment today, which is considerably different than probably the way it was way back when. Uh, there are, I want to make sure I have the right number here. 37 what what uh, again the political wonks call trifectas in state legislatures today that is to say 23 of them are controlled by republicans that means the governor's a republican the house and the senate at the state level are republicans and 14 are controlled by democrats so built into this process you have a very different political environment than you did 40 30 40 years ago so we have to think, I think, differently about what an education reform agenda is today compared to what it was 30 or 40 years ago. Mike is not denying that, so I'm not suggesting that he yeah. does. And embedded in what they say, he begins to suggest that. I've come up with a couple of phrases or ways of thinking about that might be useful to the, add to the conversation. A, a notion of opportunity and what I'd like to call opportunity pluralism, and then going along with that implementation pluralism, because when you have this changed political environment where you've got built into the agenda a red leaning and a blue leaning, you're going to have to allow a lot of room here for people to do things under the banner of red and blue. Now, we can talk about the extremes, but I'm talking more about the sort of ideological heartland <laughs> as opposed to the conflict heartland that, that that's more in the extremes. Just to add in, to be additive, uh, a lot of what Mike said actually makes a ton of sense. The idea of connecting inside outside the school. One thing we talk a lot about here is how do we make learning ubiquitous and how do we capture learning um, the 365 days of the year. Our system is not set up for that. Uh, learning does not have to happen between the walls of a school. Does it have to be during the day? So, but we don't have that kind of continuum, which I think can really do a lot to help close the kind of gaps we're actually looking to actually close. One important thing Mike pushed on was this idea of redefining success. Uh, I think that's one way of bridging the left and the right, right? So, so often we focus on math and reading proficiency as, as the goal. Uh, one thing I push and a lot of us push is that it's an important marker, but it's a means to an end. So really understanding what is exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. So we're finding, for example, economic mobility, well-being, um, personal agency. These are really fundamental principles on which we can actually build and understand that, again, getting kids ready to, to learn getting kids learning and preparing for what comes after secondary to tertiary education is an important part um, of, of all this kind of work. We've got a major information problem. Mm -hmm. um, and just let me illustrate that in a couple of ways. Uh, take the question of, to keep it simple, pandemic learning loss. If you ask parents how well their children are doing in school right now, they think they're doing great. There's like almost 80% will say, my kid is on grade level. Yeah. Um, now, we know the reality is far from that. I think it's important also to remind us that we've made progress in this country. I mean, you know, I talked about the, the history here. From the 90s uh, into the 2000s, there was tremendous progress on those test scores, right? Especially right. in math, especially in the early years, but also in reading. Uh, but it was particularly focused on the lowest achieving kids. You know, we we took the number of kids, the black students, for example, who were learning below basic on NAEP, you know, went from something like two thirds to less than half. I mean, it was still too high, but it was dramatic progress. Uh, and it was because of a whole bunch of things that were going in the right direction. The changes in education policy, more resources, greater accountability, also lower child poverty rates, good things happening outside of schools. 
all of that stuff made a difference and things got better for kids. And so I think it's important to remember that to say, hey, okay, this wiped out 20 years of progress, but we say that, think about that. There was 20 years of progress. And so now, and it's awful that this pandemic happened. We can regret some of the decisions that were made uh, during that very confusing time. Now though, let's get back to those things that worked, you know, and, and it's, we've got good, we, we know some things that do work. The science of reading works, you know, giving teachers great high quality instructional materials to, so they can be effective, that works, you know, uh, having more time on task through tutoring or extended learning time uh, long, you know, after school, Saturdays, uh, during the summer, that works, you know, and we can point to some places that are starting to turn things around. There's also a new uh, set of pedagogies that we also need to understand about how kids learn too, uh, which frankly, we didn't really understand a while ago. I shouldn't say that. The schools of psychology, I've always understood that, but never talked to the school of education, right? So the two were separate. Um, the idea of really understanding how kids learn, I think can even help us with the 50% uh, um, that we had in the past before the pandemic. This is not just a school problem or a problem to be solved by teachers, educators, schools, SEAs, LEAs. You know, this is a community problem that we all need to participate in solving. But fundamentally, you got to go back to this idea of rallying a community against the goal and making sure that different layers of the organization or the community have that kind of belonging in, in, that, in that vision. You're gonna, if you do that, you're gonna get behaviors, you're gonna get sustainability um, in the process. We hope you enjoyed this highlight reel. We invite you to share your insights, your lessons learned, your innovations, and your successful strategies as we continue to seek out bright spots that can illuminate the path to a new and better normal for kids. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you full of energy and renewed determination to take the steps necessary to accelerate equitable learning recovery. So as we close out, thank you for joining today and thank you for all that you do to support early school success for all children. Okay, well, I feel like you saw every shirt in my closet in the course of that. Um, and I apologize for that. I have a different sweater on today for what it's worth. <laughs> and I'm totally psyched to have this conversation um, with our friends, Yoli Flores, formerly of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, Lindsay Sobel from Teach Plus, and Kenneth Mason, who wears various hats in Georgia, and we'll hear a little bit about that. So uh, a question for all of you here. Um, we heard a lot about data. We heard a variety of perspectives in these conversations about what's most important. I'm curious, let's start with you, Kenneth. Um, when you hear and try to metabolize all that input, what are you left thinking? Like what's on top for you from all of those comments? Well, uh, thank you. Um, the thing that is still resonating with me, a few things are just bouncing on the inside was um, we have a communication problem. Um, however, we have information overload. We have so much data and we don't have the time um, or take the time to analyze it properly to make those decisions. And it's not communicated to the people um, that need to that need it the most to make the change. Um, and so that's when we look at it from the highest level, that's how I respond. Um, but I, I'm like, I have a lot of hats, so a few different lenses. So for 20 years, I've been in and out of classrooms, an instructional coach, modeling instruction, helping in PLCs, um, professional learning. So over the 20 years, a lot has changed in the classroom. Um, for 14 years, I've been on the Georgia State Board of Education. So at the same time, seeing all of this policy change and understanding, so I had to learn the politics of it and how um, during the, you know, before the pandemic, after the pandemic, how policy has been impacted 
by that. And again, how it impacts in, impacts a classroom. But I've been a dad for 11 years. <laughs> and and now, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't committed to uh, trying to solve a problem, boy, I am now because, um, you know, every moment I'm thinking about, you know, quality instruction for my own children, but also the health of the teachers, also, you know, the performance of the school uh, of my school. And so um, there's a lot, there's a lot to take in, but, and there's a lot to communicate. And so we should prioritize what we communicate and get it in the hands of parents and teachers so we can digest it in a way to be impactful. Well, I love that, Kenneth. Um, and you give me an opportunity to do a short advertisement for the session we did last week, which was on um, narrative and communications around issues related to children and young people. Um, I don't know, Sarah, whether we're going to have a replay of that, but we're going to have some of those people back. And it was a very, very lively and um, provocative conversation about how do we talk about these issues in ways that people are able to absorb them and people feel um, they generate energy. They, they galvanize people rather than defeat people. And so often when we come with the constant crisis message, people think, oh my God, let me read something else or think about something else. And I've been at this forever. I mean, Mike Petrelli said this, he had this great um this great sort of buoyancy and optimism like we've we've ground this down problem down before and we can do it again yes um, but mike's an outlier most people think oh my god we've been at this forever and we're not getting any place and i'm gonna think about something else um so thanks so much for kicking us off Lindsay. um when you hear all that which was i know a lot but uh tell me what popped for you Yes, well, I agree with Mike. Uh, the data is really dire and we can do something about it. I think that's a key message that came through. Um, I'll share the organization I work with, Teach Plus, works with just outstanding equity-driven, um, solutions-oriented teachers across the country. Um, and recently, um, a teacher, Marcela Alvarez, who uh, teaches in LAUSD, uh, published an op-ed talking about her experience uh, with the pandemic. And she talked about a student, Simon, who is a multilingual learner. And before the pandemic, he was really making progress. Like so many other students, the pandemic really set him back. But she worked with him so carefully using high quality instructional materials, looking at data, and she was able to help him catch up. And so the end of the article, she says that her final student teacher, uh, student parent meeting with the mother, the mother was beaming. And so I think to me, what's really critical about this is this is possible. We just have to get it right. Um, one of the real things that stuck out to me, Ann Levitt mentioned this idea of the exodus of teachers, and we are certainly seeing that. Um, Teach Plus yeah. you know, works with teachers across the country, um, deeply believes that if you find the most outstanding teachers and provide them with leadership roles everywhere from the classroom and their schools all the way to the Capitol, that that's a lever that can make a real difference for kids. And so, you know, we know that teachers are the most important lever in student learning inside the school building um, and that we have to invest in teachers. And what we're seeing is really teachers advocating for all kinds of really high quality solutions that were discussed today, like high quality instructional materials in Texas. Our teachers um, successfully advocated for teacher diversity and teacher pipeline investments in Pennsylvania, um, literacy efforts in Mississippi um, and in Illinois. So lots of that work. Um, and then the last thing I did want to highlight is also um, from Mike Petrilli and Bruno Mano just talking about how there's so much distraction in the space now, um, lots of mention to these fights and things like that. I do think policymakers have kind of taken their eye off the ball in many cases. Kenneth, you absolutely um, an exception to that rule. Um, but I but I think it, the it's so critical for us to really center the debate on these issues of teaching and learning because we do know what works. We have examples of that and um, we've got to find those examples. Um, we also believe that teachers can be those forces who can tell the stories and recenter our debate on the things that really matter um, for them. Now I'm gonna tell our audience, Lindsay, that Lindsay's a pinch hitter who came in 
to this like two hours before we did all this and whoa you are that was fantastic so um thank you um wow what a great start Yoli, you are the um, oldest and most wonderful friend in the Campaign for a Grade Level Reading uh, Network. We love having you back. Um, you've seen lots of these kind of thoughts over time. You've lived through a bunch of different complicated times wearing different hats and just really curious when you watched all that. I know you have a particular hat you wear now and I wanna hear about the family stuff for sure. But I, I would love a more general react from you as well. Well, thank you. It's great to be back. Uh, and I hope that doesn't mean I'm old. No. Uh, when you talk about being the older person. And, no, and the you, I, you're not older than I am. No chance. Uh, no first, chance. let me just say that the compilation of the of the uh, four different webinars and that reel you put together is absolutely tremendously, phenomenally helpful because some of us pop in and out of some of these webinars and it just really brought some cohesion and a through line to really deepen our understanding about what's happening, but what's possible. So what I loved about the four um, is the reassurance or the reminder that we can solve this that we we have these bright spots, we have examples um, of what we know can get our kids on track, um, whether it's Zern or really emphasizing and focusing on the right curriculum and, and tools and resources and materials, et cetera, science of reading for sure. Um, so all of that is um, uplifting. Um, but I think the two things that um, really captured me is um, the point um, that we're just starting to understand how kids learn or at least paying attention to that. And I think that yeah. really is a way forward. Um, and then the second was that this is a community problem. Uh, for so long, we keep blaming schools, the teacher, the district, and we are all responsible for whether or not all of our children um, can fulfill their destiny, um, for sure, in the education space. Now, the last thing I'll say on this segment is having been a former school board member at the LA Unified School District. And I'm glad you mentioned one of the teachers from LAUSD who is a shining star. Um, we have had gaps for a long time for black and brown kids, for kids living in poverty. Kids have not been at grade level for a long time. And with all of the optimism that Mike brings to this conversation about the progress that we made over 20 years, I think we need to listen to ourselves. Like for 20 years, we made this yeah. much progress. Yeah. I want us to be more urgent. I don't want another 20 years and just yeah. this much progress when we now know how to better serve our children. So, and we know who it's affecting. And, and, we know how to, and we have solutions for it. We have solutions. We know what we need to pay more attention to is how we scale. Yes. The courage and leadership to invest what it takes. And then the one thing that hardly anybody talked about until Kenneth, you talked about being a parent is the role of parents. And I know we're going to come back to that. So I'll save that for a little later, John. Well, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I want to stick with this for a second because you all said so many interesting things. And while I'm yakking for here for a second, I want to remind people who are watching to please put questions in the Q&A because the four of us can talk the whole time, I'm sure, but that's not really the point here. We had those polls. We want to know what you think. We, know, we want to know what you're curious about. Um, so please put questions in the Q&A. So here we are. We, we agree um, progress is possible. We agree we've made some progress before. We agree that we're frustrated that that progress is not nearly what we'd like it to be. Um, I'm curious, you all wear different hats here and see this 
from different angles, although it looks like you're looking into the same room right now, it sounds like. Um, what, what do you think ultimately is standing in our way here? Um, what, why haven't we made more progress? Why, why, you know, your fingers this far apart, Yoli, instead of your hands this far apart? Um, your thought, Yoli, to start, what's, what's standing in our way, which is, of course, a conversation that's going to take us towards how can we deal with the things that are standing in our way and elevate all this. So, uh, Yoli, start us out. What do you think? And again, uh, all your hats, GLR, school board, family, everything, um, bring it all to us. Well, as somebody um, at the top of the reel said, there's no single answer or no single bullet. Um, there's a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with what um, Kenneth talked about, and that's the misinformation um, that parents hold about how their children are doing. Mm -hmm. And we know Learning Heroes does this uh, annual family poll. And I think it was the 22 poll. I know there's a new one, but in the 22 poll, 92% of parents think that their kids are on track. Mm -hmm. And as we all have concurred, it's the furthest from the truth. So we need to be telling parents the truth. Part of the reason parents believe their kids are on track because they their kids come home with report cards that have A and B. So they think their kids are okay. Nobody mm -hmm. tells them that they're not reading at grade level. Um, so we have to tell parents the truth, not to scare them, but because they can begin to demand better for their children. And it, you know, we know that parents that know how to advocate for their children, wealthier, better educated person, people, parents, um, in general, their kids get a better education. So we need to build up that demand side for parents. Um, so that's, I, I think, a big, a big piece. I think what's also missing um, is basic leadership, basic leadership around the importance um, of why it matters for all children to get a good education, not just some children. But the implications, and you know, a lot of us are talking about our democracy, which feels like it's falling apart. Well, wait until we have more kids who are undereducated. Yeah, yeah. Kenna, your thoughts? What do you think standing in our way? Um, in one word, inertia. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm a. I studied physics in college and I, I struggled to teach it um, when I was a high school teacher, but, uh, and, and I live it as a parent resistance and change. Um, there's, we have resistance to change as a major barrier in our institution of education. If you look at it as an industry, um, I think, yo, you just said it. We just learned how, students' brains work. We just learned that. And how about we're acknowledging now that teachers have social and emotional needs and may be affected by their own trauma in the classroom, and it may affect their instruction. So there's, a, you know, we're just, so knowledge. Um, I think a lack of knowledge is a barrier. Uh, prioritizing the wrong things. And I'll summarize that and I'll say some school districts, some state level um, leaders uh, prioritize what I'll call scorekeeping instead of learning. Um, and, and then I think um, when, when, you, when, you prior when you prioritize learning, then that has everything to do with the family and the community. It is not a a, a singular issue. It, it must, and, and one of the speakers said it, learning should happen, should be planned learning well beyond the boundaries of the school. Um, and, and so we, we get in a nice groove with, um, you know, our early grades because we find success, because we build a model that works. 
But then do we look at how those students transition to middle school and all their needs in the classroom and otherwise change? Have we adjusted that model and, and our standards and our learning practices there? And then for high school, are we really getting students ready for college and career today? No, not today, tomorrow, the next day, 2024, we need to be adjusting what we do. We have to be nimble. And, um, you know, policies don't allow for that nibbleness often. And so there's a lot of barriers there. And the last barrier that I don't want to talk about is the <laughs> politics of education. Mm -hmm. It's been politicized, polarized, and comes along with that is um, is interest come with that, that are outside of what we need in a classroom. And so um, th there's, a, uh, there's a lot of barriers there, but we have the truth. We have amazing teachers and students potential are untapped after the pandemic, I, you know, I believe that we, yes, there's learning loss on our current measure, but I, my seven-year-old learned to type and do research. We, we're not measuring that, but it's an employability skills that we want high school students to have. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. That's cool about your seven-year-old too. Um, <laughs> Lin Lindsay, um, your top line on what what you think is standing in the way of greater progress, particularly for so kids yoli. who are from from marginalized communities and kids who are growing up in in challenging circumstances. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Yoli, yes to parents. Um, and Ken, I think your point about um, uh, resistance to change or or the difficulty of change. Um, I think there is in uh, ineffective attention to teachers. Um, teachers are adult humans. It is very difficult for humans to change and <laughs> of change going on in our society is really vast. We also know how to make it work. So, you know, all of us know how hard it is to change. Say we say, okay, I'm gonna run a 10K in three months. Well, starting from the couch and getting to a 10K, that's that's really hard. But if you join a running club, that might be that motivation to get you there. So I think one of the things that we really believe is that you can't make change, you can't do change to teachers and the reverse when you engage teachers in the decision-making process, when you really build on their expertise that they bring to the table because yeah. they are the experts who work with students every single day, deeply embedded in communities and working with families, um, that that's a lever that can make a really big difference. Um, I'll share a couple of ways that I think we need to engage teachers. One is at the decision-making table, and I, I really mean the U.S. Congress, state legislatures, state boards of ed, um, all the way to, um, you know, instructional leadership teams in, in teacher schools. Um, a second piece is engaging teachers um, as leaders, um, in their schools. So, you know, Teach Plus works with teachers um, who are leading continuous improvement efforts. And we've seen really significant progress in that, you know, that they'll work with a team of teachers and sometimes administrators to look at data, set goals, test things out, test if it works and, and figure that out. Those are the really critical pieces. And so when we're doing things like adopting high quality instructional materials, let's make sure teachers are at the table writing the bill, uh, picking the curriculum, setting what the, you know, the, the criteria are, and then also leading that implementation, because we know that teachers listen to other teachers, um, and that when we have professional learning communities led by fellow teachers who can say, oh yeah, that part of the curriculum, that's really hard to teach. Here's how I got around that, like not letting their foot off the gas or, or saying, you know, all kids can't learn kind of thing. And no, they're saying, yes, we can, and here's how, how we're going to do it. So I think that's really important. I'll share just one um, final example. So Emily Gaska is a is a teacher who has um, participates in a program that Teach Plus runs called the Change Agent Program. She's a, a Chicago public schools teacher, and they are implementing the Skyline curriculum in Chicago, you know, high quality instructional materials. And she said when she started, there was so much resistance. Again, natural adult resistance is very very hard to make change. 
But then when she got the training to lead her peers, suddenly that resistance starts to break away. They build the trust on their team and then they can embrace that curriculum and really make a difference for kids. And the results were really impressive um, and in terms of um, how students did in literacy because of that adult learning that happened between educators. Fantastic. Thanks. I, I'm going to editorialize here for a moment and add a couple of things. Um, I think that... Um, as, as a couple of you said, like change is hard and there is not a single solution. Um, and it's, it takes time. Like we, we want to, uh, let's adopt something and then let's see results in 12 months. Um, and maybe we see small results, but it's, it's just, that's not how this work goes. And I think the communities that have had the greatest success have, um, have sustained their interests and their commitment over time through some ups and downs uh, in annual results. I, we certainly saw that in the in the campaign um, that I led on high school graduation when I was at America's Promise. Um, that's really, really important. Um, also, you can have all the right ideas, but if you don't do high quality implementation, it doesn't really matter. And sometimes I think we pay a lot of attention to adoption um, oh, let's figure out what the right solution is. Let's adopt the right solution. But actually, yeah, that part isn't, I, you know, we probably all have a list of five things that we think a, a combination of nice, five nice things, if we did those things. Yeah, but we have to do them at high quality with fidelity and flexibility. Mm -hmm. And over time, then we begin to see results. And it's that's all hard to do. That's all really hard to do. Um, Yoli, let me come back to you on the on the family stuff because um, you know it was one of the big ahas of the of the pandemic was I, I think people adjusted how they think about the role of families and families adjusted how the how they think about the role of families. Can you talk a little bit about what that aha was about, but most importantly, what that means now. In, in the in the season that we're in. Yeah, so what we were experiencing during the pandemic, which we thought would be a silver lining <laughs> if there were any of the pandemic, was an, uh, an opportunity for teachers and parents to really see each other and what it takes to educate children. So teachers could peek into the homes of family, see parents sitting next to their little kids, uh, supporting them, helping them. <clears throat> and we started to hear from teachers saying, parents do care. Like, parents are so essential. And, and there was a lot of gratitude. And then the reverse also happened with parents acknowledging just how hard it is to be a teacher with that many kids in a classroom, because you only get, you know, three to four kids at most at home. And so that kind of an appreciation for each other gave many of us in the family engagement space a lot of hope, because we've got 50 years of research. That family engagement, the, in, the engagement of families in their children's education, that parent-teacher relationship is one of the strongest strategies to get us to school success. And so fast forward, so we're thinking, okay, finally, the moment has met us, the, as Dr. <laughs> Karen Knapp likes to say, <laughs> instead of you know pushing for people to pay attention to the 50 years of research around family, school leaders were saying, oh my God, we need to embrace this. So that was the hope. Um, in my experience, uh, I'm starting to, or in my, um, what I'm starting to feel is that we're forgetting what we experienced <laughs> mm -hmm. because we're not seeing the levels of investment and family engagement that we thought we would. Now in California, fortunately, the legislature is and has been paying attention. They just put $50 million into building capacity of LEAs around family engagement. We have a new family engagement national center. Um, 
and lots of work really to build that capacity. So <clears throat> there is a commitment here. I don't see that across the country. Um, and we're paying a lot of attention to that work in California to make sure we get it right. Um, and we now have actually more evidence. So Learning Heroes and TNTP just, and I think they did a webinar, so I'll, I'll recast yep. it quickly. Uh, <clears throat> but they are in the midst of a research study that looked in Illinois, schools that were before the pandemic and then after the pandemic had strong family engagement. And the results are quite impressive. So chronic absenteeism is um, less of an impact in schools that had strong family engagement or there is less chronic absenteeism in schools that had strong family engagement. Um, the decline in ELA and math proficiency is less for those schools that had fat, strong family engagement. So not only do the 50 years of research, but current research pre and post pandemic are underscoring again, the power of family engagement. So I hope that that silver lining that we thought would materialize does because there is quite robust and powerful evidence that this could be the one of several things to get us over this hump. Curious, Kenneth, how you think about um how you think about family engagement when you when you put on your your um, state board hat and you think oh policy and you know all those big things uh, uh, where does fa family uh, family engagement fit in your sort of universe and your lexicon of ideas? Yeah, it's um, I think we we should uh, equip parents with all the information they need to be able to feel like they belong in the school. Like the parents should have a sense of belonging. I I interview a lot of um, now this was my school improvement hat, but get to interview a lot of students and parents, and sometimes parents are uncomfortable in their own school building. Um, when and being interviewed with talking about instruction, there's there's a we have to make parents feel um, a sense of belonging there uh, with policy. I'm very proud of well, this week. Um, our state board, um, we passed an early literacy led uh, rule that clearly articulates. Um, clearly articulates from early education what the expectation will be for K-12 parents as well, including your responsibility, um, your the information you'll get from screeners, the responsibility that not only the district, but schools can provide, and really um, not letting a policy go down um, just and pass by, but we paid attention, argued, wrung our hands about the details. And the main detail was, when are we going to explain all this to parents? When, how, and how many times? The great part of what's happening in Georgia is there's a, a, a flood of uh, attention to literacy. Um, but it can get lost in the language of the policy. And quite honestly, our board, board members, if you're not studied on this, you could get lost in the understanding and how you communicate it back. And I think we, as a state board member, I feel like parents should be able to, to call me. I'm part of that community. And I also represent a congressional district. So I should be able to communicate to parents in language that they understand and, and give them resources to help them along the way. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, we have a question from um, in the Q&A um, about the use of a community school strategy to drive student achievement and um, some curiosity around the status of the, the community school movement in each of the panelist states. Um, Lindsay, are you aware of community school stuff going on in Louisiana or in other states where you're particularly active? 
Um, there are uh, definitely community school efforts going on. Teach Plus is in 12 states across the country um, and um, looking to expand to additional states. Um, and we do see that um, in you know a variety of states across the country. I know California is one that has a really strong um, community schools um, and, and Gilly certainly uh, done incredible leadership in that regard. Um, but I do think you know, just from the teacher perspective, um, we hear so much from teachers that they deeply believe that, you know, that education is such an incredibly critical lever for changing generational poverty and make a huge difference for students. Um, and also, there are a lot of other levers outside the school that are also impacting student learning. So, um, so that, you know, they, they would be the first ones to step up and advocate for the services that are necessary for a full family to be supported um, around a child, because we, we do much better when uh, students and families are, are supported in every way, including educationally. Yola, you want to talk for a second about what's going on in California? Yeah, yeah so it's a, a big investment. It's a big, big deal in California, yeah. billion dollar uh, deal. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I'm appreciative that our state really understands the whole child, whole family, whole community um, is needed in response, not just to learning loss, but just to the uneven, inequitable um education and supports that kids of color kids living in poverty have had for generations um, that's the work of families and schools we're really actually connecting the community schools movement with the family engagement movement in fact one of the pillars in our community schools framework is family and community engagement um, and so at families and schools we're working with the all of the leas across the state to really bridge the two so it's a big deal, and we're we've obviously placed a big bet on that. Yeah, I, that's fantastic, and um, I think what all of us want to see is a lot of activity in that space, and then a lot of research on that activity to understand what of that actually drives student achievement, and uh, to a, a comment that Kenneth made earlier, also what drives positive youth development in other dimensions that perhaps may be more difficult to um, to measure than you know simply the the standardized test that kids take not to diminish the importance of those markers but to broaden the picture of what it takes for young people to move forward in life um, i see we're very close to the end of our time um, we have one other question in the box let me see um, uh, what progress have we made in teaching all to read? Um, uh, what about kids who have special needs uh, and so forth? Um, uh, Lindsay, you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the progress that we think we've made in understanding better? Um, you kind of talked about this a little bit also. Just how 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 learning to read works and, um, and what that means. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, folks who are experienced in this field certainly know that there has been kind of a misperception around the way to teach students to read and that there is now a real strong and I think national very positive movement to really focus on the five pillars of reading that it is, you know, um, so, so much, um, so many pieces of this work and that that students really do need direct instruction in phonics, but also a broad set of um, experiences around developing language and phonetic awareness and, all, and, and book awareness and things like that. Um, so that is critical. I think there are two states I want to talk about that have done this work really well. Um, one is the state of Mississippi, which kind of yep. led the movement around this science of reading effort. Yep. Um, they did you know, lead the way past really significant legislation that kind of, um, it was very systemic. So, you know, worked with schools of ed, teacher uh, preparation and professional development. It provided investments in um, reading coaches and instructional coaches so that teachers could improve their practice and things like right. that. So a really big piece of the work. We saw very, very significant growth in that. And I think it was um, shared in the chat. Um, there was a teacher, um, John Fredericks, who was just recently published in Newsweek, who said, you know, we, they call it the Mississippi miracle. It wasn't a miracle. They did, they, they did the work and they followed it all the way through, through the difficult implementation. And that's right. right. Yeah, that's the implementation, um, right. 
And then I'm here today representing um, Teach Plus's CEO, Keir Orange-Jones, who is a 12-year um, State Board of Education member in the state of Louisiana. Um, Louisiana has also done very, very significant um, and um, and you know she is very sorry she can't be here today. She was uh, they are taking a very critical vote on the board, um, and and that ran way over this morning. Um, but but she did share insights from um, what Louisiana has done. Um, very similarly, absolute laser focus um, on early literacy, family engagement, and then really working to help adults make that difficult change um, by adopting high quality instructional materials and then supporting teachers to make that change um, across the board. Um, so we know this is possible. We also know that we have to have teachers at the center of implementation of it um, and that we hope to see uh, much uh, more emphasis on this over time. That John, I'll just add that this is what I'm the most Please. hopeful about. I am super hopeful about the direction of um, so many states and embracing the science of reading and structured literacy instruction. That is, um, I mean, we've got to solve a lot of other problems, but if we can get that right, because we yes. have the evidence, right? We have the evidence that this is what helps our kids get proficient in reading. Um, a plug for paying special attention to English learners and um, implementing science of reading with fidelity and not just a phonics only approach, yes. uh, but it's gotta be the full five um, essential skills. But I am I am incredibly hopeful. And this is what where we need to bring families along. They don't know any, no one's talking to them about science of reading. Okay. So we've just launched Read LA in Los Angeles and that's gonna be a big focus of bringing our families along um, around what's possible. Fantastic. Um, Kenneth? Uh, some final thoughts on what, oh, what's I, making, making you hopeful and where you think we need to go? Oh, well, what makes me hope, hopeful is when I go in the classrooms and um, the, the, the brilliance that's untapped is there. It's uh, so many opportunities for young people out there um, and uh, convenings like, like this give me more hope that this is happening all across the country. That's fantastic. I want to just note, um, we didn't talk specifically when we were talking about um, science of reading about what the, the person was asking about, which was specifically around um, kids who have challenges with dyslexia and what this, what this means um, for their learning and how we're attentive to, um, I mean, all kinds of neurodivergent um, yes. uh, forms of learning. Um, really, really important question. I appreciate it. I wish we'd had more time to. And, to and that's what I that. was speaking of when I talked about the policy. We had to take the time to understand, and, and it was we have we have um, have been impacted by uh, parents of dyslexic students from you know for two years now, and they've become part of our you know they've informed not only our ELA process, but you know where we are now. And it is a complicated, sensitive, time-sensitive uh, manner. And that's why we had to get our the, implement, the steps of implementation absolutely correct and provide guidance, plenty of guidance um, to all parties. So thank you for that question. And yes, I echo that importance. Yeah, for those totally. Families. Totally. Um, I, I just wanna thank uh, Lindsay, Great job of pinch hitting all star. You made the all star team, even though you were a pinch hitter. That's pretty good. Yoli, always marvelous to see you and hear your thoughts. Kenneth, this was uh, terrific. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, thanks on behalf of everybody who watched and listened. And I'm going to turn it back now to uh, Hillary for a second to just um, close us out. Thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure to hear from all of you and your reflections on what we've been talking about over the last several months at GLR. Um, plan all of you to engage in some year-end learning and join us for some of our upcoming sessions. We have Building Parent Power, Fostering a Movement of Informed Learning Agents on December 19th. On the 26th, we have the urgent need for effective child care and ECE policy. And then on January 3rd, we have the first month of school and beyond nurturing attendance every day, 
co-sponsored by Attendance Work. These are reruns of sessions that we've had that have been some of our most popular and powerful ones this year. So please, if you didn't see them the first time, come back for them again. And then on January 9th, we return to live GLR sessions every Tuesday, as you've come to expect, with Big Bets Working Digital connectivity. Um, so thank you all once again, Yoli, Lindsay, Kenneth, and of course, John. Um, it was wonderful to hear all of the conversation today. Be well, everyone. Thank Thanks you so much.